Oh dear. <laughs> Hello everybody. I was just reading the comments as I was getting myself set up here. I've changed the audio. Tell me if it makes any difference. I think it does, hopefully. Um, hello everyone who has already tuned in and has their coffee and headphones on and is ready and waiting. Um, to <laughs> Peter, Peter's comment to Terry. Um, <laughs> so the other day when I sent out the newsletter with everybody's beautiful images from the London in Bloom competition, I accidentally miscredited a picture. I was frantically trying to switch from one screen to another to make sure that I'd gotten all the names right. And of course I missed one. Anyway, hence that <laughs> did make me laugh. Um, sorry if it's dreary and uh, raining where you are, but hopefully you are tucked up indoors preferably in a duvet or a dressing gown or something, and uh, doing the minimal requirements today. Uh, we are going to talk about filters. The reason being that so many of you enjoyed the little talk that I did the other day on the subject of film photography, and to be honest, I was thinking, what else can I talk about in terms of film? Well, something that applies to both film and digital so that it keeps everybody happy um, is filters. I wrote an article in Nikon Owner magazine number 64, I think it was, uh, I have to double check that now, but anyway, called Fantastic Filters and Where to Find Them, um, and that has a bit of a, an outline of what we're going to talk about today, but as a freebie to you all and to keep you entertained over the weekend, I've actually put a downloaded copy of that magazine in the drive folder. So um, if you want to, at the end of this, you can download that. And in the meantime, we're going to crack on. So first order of business, if you are just freshly joining us um, or you're watching this on a playback, you can still subscribe using the subscribe button. And if you hit the little bell picture next to the subscribe button, then you can be notified as to when I go live or when we're doing um, videos and uploading. Fantastic. Looks like the audio is... <laughs> Apparently, the opposite of what I thought I should tick is what I should have ticked. So there we go. I've sorted it now. Um, brilliant. So subscribe if you haven't already subscribed and click the bell so that you can be notified. Also, super chat. Don't forget that little dollar sign if you want to contribute to the staff coffee fund. Um, someone, and I actually don't know who it was because... I wasn't told, but all I got sent was a screenshot. Someone very kindly bought a coffee fund donation off our website. Um, and rather than just buying us one coffee, bought us 10. So that's one for each staff member, which is really, really kind. So um, to the person who did that, thank you very much. Any of you that want to contribute um, using Super Chat, please do so throughout the stream. And if you're watching this after we've live streamed, you can use the link at the bottom, which says coffee fund. Hopefully we've got all the technical um, difficulties and hiccups out of that now. So in terms of filters, there are a number of different uh, filters for digital and separate ones for film. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm also going to put a link to the Nikon reference uh, in the stream, below the stream, uh, which will be the little bit.ly link which says the Nikon filter system so that you can actually see the details of everything that I'm talking about so that if you're there sitting there frantically with your notebook trying to make notes, you can actually see it all written down um, by someone. There are a few typos on that article that Nikon have written, but, you know, I'll try and clarify it where I can. So the first filter that we're going to talk about is the obvious one. It's a neutral colour, sometimes called UV, also sometimes called skylight, um, mine, I'm going to show you here, I'm just going to flick over to this screen. So this is a neutral, it's got a big fat fingerprint on it there because I picked it up accidentally, put my finger on it. Um, so normally you would put just a plain glass filter um, as high quality as you can possibly get your hands on, on your lens to protect it. There is a difference between UV and neutral colour. UV um, actually prevents UV light. Now UV light going through a lens and onto film can actually soften your images slightly and affect a little bit of the colouring just because of the way that UV light affects film. It doesn't work the same way for digital so you can use either a neutral colour or a UV filter doesn't matter which one, as long as it's got some multi-coatings to provide you with some protection against flare and ghosting. So here in my hand, I have a Hoya uh, Pro One Digital Multi-Coated, also UV, but 
um, it's just a plain glass filter effectively. MC, multi-coated, or in Nikon's terms, NC, neutral color, effectively do the same thing. So they're just protection for the glass. Skylight, however, and a lot of people get confused because skylight filters have a slight pinkish tinge to them and they were generally used as a sort of slight color correction filter for film. Yay, Terry, thank you. Thank you for your contribution to the coffee fund. I'm going to get like a trumpet <laughs> so that, or something. Let me get my guitar out and, <laughs> and do a strum every time someone does a, a contribution to the coffee fund. Thank you very, very much. I have to uh, work out a more appropriate celebration um, method doing that. It's a shame I can't put confetti. I don't want to have to clear, clean up confetti every time someone does a contribution. But thank you very much. Um, all right, so skylight filters effectively have a slightly pinkish tinge. So whereas with this one, if I hold up a piece of paper here, which I is one I prepared earlier, this has, believe it or not, no color to it. So although the camera adjusted a little bit for the fact that I suddenly got darker, this is completely color free. If I were using a skylight filter, this is actually much more extreme than a skylight filter. This is a warm up filter, but do you see how much warmer that is? A skylight is slightly less warm than that. So if you put a skylight on your digital camera, the camera will compensate for it by trying to adjust the white balance because it will get a little bit confused about the fact that there's a pinkish tinge on there. Um, so if you're using digital, go for a neutral color or a UV. If you're using film, then go for a UV or a skylight. Those are really primarily protection filters. You just leave them on all the time. And as I've mentioned in the article, and you'll see there, um, there is a difference depending on how many coatings your protective filter has. So if you've got a filter with no coatings, which is quite literally a piece of glass that you've just shoved onto the front of your lens, you won't get any protection against ghosting or flare, and you might end up slightly softening your image a little bit. Whereas if you um, were to put a higher spec filter, let's call it, I mean, it's just more coatings essentially, the more coatings the better, then you'll get less reflection, less flare, when the light hits the glass it won't then bounce between your front element and the and the glass itself. Um, just having a quick look at all the comments, um, people are from everywhere, it's amazing, uh, <laughs> goodness me, all over the place, hello from Canada and um, in Botswana and um, deepest, darkest, Tembury world. <laughs> um, that's phenomenal. Thank you all for joining this afternoon. Um, so yes, that was the first kind of most logical way to go was to talk about the UV filters. Um, now, Nick says Skylight filter was supposed to also cut down haze. Yes, but they didn't make that much difference. There are anti-haze filters. B&W actually make quite high um, I would say premium filters, high grade filters, which have a special anti-haze layer. The Nikon filters, I never found did that very much. And the Nikon, uh, not that you're necessarily gonna remember this, but the Nikon spec of filter was called the L1BC. Yay, Trevor, thank you. Yes, I'll keep it up with my weight lifting. I do a bit of that as well. Um, thank you very, very much. I think everyone's gonna have a, a coffee today. Um, I will let them all know to, um, to take a, a chunk of that. Thank you very, very much. Um, right, so the Nikon L1BC, which a lot of people have kicking around because those were the skylight filters back in the day, um, are skylight. They're slightly pinkish. If you put them on a piece of paper, you will see a pink tinge to them. Um, if you take a neutral color or a UV filter and you hold it against a piece of paper, it will come out white. So you'll know that it is a completely neutral filter. Those ones, we put them on the front of our glass to act as protection. And as I talked about a little bit the other day, you could use a lens hood um, or you can use a filter or you can use both, but it essentially stops you from scratching your glass. There are some lenses that have very deep recessed front elements. This one does not, but the front element's quite tiny. Um, but if you've got a very, very deep front element, you won't necessarily need that protection unless you're gonna throw something at your lens. <laughs> Don't throw something at your lens. Um, if you got so close that a, a tree branch scratched it or something, I could understand why maybe you should put a filter on there. But most of us are, are a bit more cautious than that with our precious Nikon lenses. Um, so those neutral color filters you can use for digital. Obviously for film, you can use UV um, or skylight. 
The next one that you can use for both is circular polarizers. However, <laughs> there is a stipulation here. Circular polarizers and linear polarizers, not to send you all to sleep right at the beginning of my talk here, um, but they are two different things. So linear polarizers are these big fat um, polarizing filters that Nikon used to make. Um, they would cut certain type of polarizing light that comes from the sun, obviously, where the light comes from, um, and would make your pictures a bit more saturated, make the skies a bit deeper, and cut some reflection off um, surfaces, reflective surfaces like glass or water. Now, those don't work. Linear polarizers don't work very well on digital cameras. You can use them, and I know there's there's always going to be someone who says, well, I use mine, and it's fine, um, which is great. So essentially, you can use them on digital cameras, but digital cameras handle polarized light slightly differently, which is why usually we use these things, which are circular polarizers. Now, a circular polarizer twists and gets, I don't know if it's going to show you in this video because I don't have a very reflective surface to show you, but essentially as you turn it, you will get a great, oh, my hand is going slightly lighter. There you go. And then if I turn it that way, eventually it will go slightly darker. There we go. So you'll get more or less polarizing effect the more you turn this. And sometimes it's personal preference. Um, sometimes it's a matter of catching the light at the right angle to get rid of your reflections. It's very useful if you want to do pictures of water um, and also glass. So if you're taking pictures of buildings and sometimes you want to cut a bit of the reflection down, it won't get rid of it altogether, particularly not if you're in very bright sunlight, but it will cut it down quite considerably. Um, the other thing that it's worth noting on polarizers is that apart from making your skies bluer and cutting reflection off glass and water, it won't work on chrome surfaces. So if you're doing product shots of something with metal, it won't actually work on that. So I wouldn't recommend it for trying to cut those reflections, it won't make any difference. Um, but it will make your skies bluer. So if you were going traveling, for example, and you wanted, you were doing a landscape and you want a very dark sky, you could use a polarizer. There is another type of filter that I will talk about a bit later for darkening skies specifically, or for making your pictures a bit darker. But if you want a subtle effect, then you would use this. Now, Polarizers are not actually supposed to affect your exposure. They do a little bit sometimes. It depends on the polarizer, um, but it's not by very much. So it shouldn't make a huge amount of effect. Whereas you've got other filters, the ones I'm going to talk about later, uh, which are called ND filters, those you would use to actually slow down your shutter speed so you can open up a bit more. Um, great in the studio for watches. There you go. John, John knows. So yes. Yeah, so if you want to cut reflections out, I know a few people who use these for taking pictures of paintings, for example, behind glass, um, will cut the reflections out for you a little bit. Um, so that's the polarizers. If you've got an old linear polarizer, feel free to bung it on your lens and see what happens. I did that once. The result of that experiment was that my picture ended up with sort of streaks of light and it was really weird and it wasn't actually what I was after, but it was fine. It, it produced a very strange kind of special effect. Um, so linear polarizers are usually used for film cameras where cir circular polarizers are usually used for digital and that's, that's the difference to them. Um, so those are two types of filters that you can use for digital. There are a couple of filters um, that we call kind of special effects filters. One of them is a star filter. Unfortunately, I can't show you on the camera here. I don't think it's going to work at all. This is a star filter. Have I got a point sort of light source that I can... Nah, it's not going to work. Um, essentially, it's a filter. I've got a star eight filter here as well. It's a filter which has lots of little lines drawn all over it so that when it catches points of light, it makes that kind of quite, I think the word I want to use is twee, <laughs> like little starbursts. And it can be quite cute if you're doing, um, I, the time that I get these out is Christmas time. <laughs> It's when I want to do pictures of Christmas trees or Christmas lights and I want all those little starbursts everywhere, then that's when these come in handy. Um, you can obviously use them for other purposes, but um, they essentially make the catch light look like a little bit of a starburst. Um, and Nikon don't make them, but Hoya do. I've got two Hoya star filters there. The other special effects filter um, that Nikon do make, and weirdly they still produce them, is a soft focus filter, um, which... <laughs> isn't 
isn't that much different to taking a plain glass filter and putting some Vaseline around the outer edge of it, but it's obviously higher quality than doing that. Um, essentially what a soft focus filter does is makes your subject nice and sharp, but blurs out the rest. It gives you that kind of potentially, um, I'd say maybe 80s portrait look. <laughs> But anyway, so they still make those um, and you can get them. Uh, th Hello, John. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you're liking the live streams. Honestly, so many people have sent me such wonderful emails um, over the last couple of weeks. It's been fantastic. Every morning when I open up my inbox, I've got a fresh load of, I mean, everything from photographs to just people saying thank you to um, suggestions. I love it. So keep it coming. You are always welcome to email me or email the shop. Um, and I do, I, I'm glad that you appreciate it as well and that you enjoy it. As I say, if you want to show your love in a more material way, then you can contribute using Super Chat. Um, but it's it's all appreciated anyway. You guys just being here, everybody being here is very much appreciated. I think yesterday um, we had over 70 people all tuning in at the same time, which blew my mind actually. <laughs> I thought, don't think about the quantity of people that are watching this or I'll get stage fright. Um, all right, so those are the special effects filters. I'm not gonna talk about those too much because I wanted to talk about the nitty gritty ones, which are the film filters. Now, the other day, you might remember I talked about uh, picture controls and how you could shoot in black and white. It was one of the very early streams that we did. Uh, shooting in black and white in your digital camera and then applying a filter, a high contrast filter, for example. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is real life, ooh, look, it's a yellow filter, um, colored filters. So these things that you would, look, I disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> some magic filter. Um, this is a green filter for anyone that wants to, um, wants to know, but it's actually invisible because of the green screen. Fun times. Um, so, oh, Peter, thank you. Yay. Thank you for your contribution. Is it some material appreciation <laughs> showing um, for my live streams? Thank you very, very much. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown and it will be fairly brief because I have written it all up in the article in the magazine that I'm going to share with you for free this weekend. Um, and also it is covered a little bit more in depth in the Nikon website article, which I'm also going to share in a link at the bottom of the stream. But I thought it's worth having someone talk you through them and actually show you. So I've taken loads of pictures using these colored filters. I think maybe I might have mislabeled one or two of them as I was looking through them today. I was thinking, oh, actually... <laughs> Maybe that's a green filter and not a yellow, but we'll have a look. Um, yes, you can absolutely replicate for digital. You can replicate filter effects in um, various different software um, programs, not just Lightroom. But uh, you will sometimes, if you want really specialist filter effects, you will sometimes just need to download a plugin. Just to answer um, Mark or Sue or Mark and Sue. Um, yes, you can use a polarizer on the 200 to 500 if you are traveling, for example, or if you're shooting somewhere that you find the sky gets a little bit bleached out in comparison to the subject. A polarizer will handle that and will make your skies a little bit bluer. I will also talk about um, the neutral density filters a little bit later because um, you may find that is an alternative solution. But polarizers will generally make things look a little bit more saturated, which is quite nice. So on the topic of using film and shooting black and white, there are some filters that you can use to help you out. The most common one used is a yellow filter. Now, these yellow filters, the Nikon ones are quite rare, and unfortunately, I don't have all of the Nikon colors myself at home. We do have some in the shop. Um, there is This is quite a deep-ish yellow. Oh, interesting. It goes green when I put it against a piece of paper. Okay, well, I won't do that. I'll put it against my face then. Um, so this is kind of the middle one. There is a lighter yellow and there is a deeper yellow. Um, the one that's kind of used for general purpose and portraiture tends to be this one and the lighter one. Now, what the yellow filter does is it absorbs blue and UV light. So you can use it in place of a UV filter just for general um, shooting. It does slightly heighten your contrast. Um, and if you're shooting clouds or skies, for example, your skies in black and white will appear slightly darker. The Y52, which I don't have here, which is a Nikon code, is the darker one of this. It's a slightly deeper yellow and um, you generally use it for landscape. That's, that's mostly what it's used for. Whereas this one and the lighter sort of very soft yellow, I'd call it, 
um, are used for portraiture and also for just general shooting. So um, that is one that you could just generally keep on your camera at all times and you wouldn't have a problem if you're shooting black and white, obviously. Don't leave it on if you're shooting colour. I'm going to go over the colour filters, um, sorry, the, fil the filters for colour film shortly. Um, this is going to be rather interesting, trying to show you these because they're both green. Oh, you can see this one. Okay, that's good. This is um, what Nikon call an X0. I'm not sure why they called the green filters X, but they did. This is an X1 and it's very, it's so dark green that it is exactly the same color as my green screen. <laughs> so if you imagine a really dark green filter, then that's that one. This one is a slightly lighter green. Now, why do you use green filters? Well, green filters actually allow green and yellow light to pass through obviously, and they cut out red and blue light. So quite flattering for portraiture, specifically if you've got, um, don't know how easy it is to see here, probably not so easy, but essentially, if you were to put this on a lens and look through it, a person's skin, all of the redness and blemish, um, any blemishes and any kind of dark patches tend to disappear with the use of a green filter. So it does get used for portraiture, I, the X0, as this one is, also can be used for general purpose, while the X1 is usually used just for portraiture. I've used it for landscape, <laughs> so go figure. Um, that's quite interesting. Would you use colour filters in digital as we um, as with film? There's a slight difference there. Oh, sorry, I have to say, wow. Thank you, Charles. Wow, thank you very much for your contribution. That's <laughs> so easily distracted. Uh, from the flatlands of Suffolk and a beautiful part of the world it is too. Uh, thank you very, very much. So to answer um, Anthony's question, color filters like this, you can't put on digital cameras. Um, so you can't physically, you can obviously mount it on the lens, but because your sensor is made up of different colored pixels, all that happens is that these actually cancel out those pixels um, recording information. So the light passes through and then it, it confuses it awfully. So you get this kind of psychedelic, almost infrared effect sometimes. If you're gonna put a green filter on there, it will look very, very strange. So these are generally just for film. What you can do um, with your digital camera is you can use the picture controls as I talked about last week. Um, if you're shooting in black and white, then you can use those, they're basically, artificial simulations of the filters that I'm showing you today. So you can apply those and um, you go to the shooting menu, photo shooting menu, and then you've got an option that says set picture controls. And then under monochrome, if you go into the monochrome menu, you've got all these different little filter options, um, which as I, say, I talked about in my stream, I think it was last Tuesday or Wednesday. So if you want to um, have a little look at that, I go into that a bit more in depth. But in terms of film, um, filters, you actually want to use the actual colored filters. So here we go. So we've got the green X0 for general purpose. We've got the yellow sort of mid or light for general purpose. So both of those could be used potentially somewhat interchangeably. Some people call this one, this greeny one here, a yellow green um, because it is almost like a lime green color. Um, whereas this one is considered a mid yellow. The darker ones, like the very deep yellow and the um, the very dark green, are usually so high contrast that you use them for very specialist purposes. But the middle ones you can use for general purpose photography. Um, so that is your yellow filters. That's the green filters. Now, the most famous one, I would say, is this one, is the red filter. Um, it does have a brother. It's uh, an orange filter. Gosh, is that working? Yes, it is. So there you go. So we've got an orange and a red filter. And so the green screen likes that. You can see those really clearly. Um, these will both heighten contrast dramatically. So if you want a very, um, a very contrasty look, more so than you would use with a yellow filter, you'd use an orange. If you want almost like an infrared effect, super dark shadows, super light highlights, then you go for the red filter because the red filter um, obviously only really allows mostly red light to pass through, um, which means that everything ends up in black and white being very, very high contrast. Um, I have some sample pictures, which I will show you now um, as I've gone through all of those. Uh, let me switch over to my screen grab so you can see what I can see. All right, so here, I, as I say, I think I may have mislabeled a couple of these because I was going based on some rough notes that I put um, in a notebook while I was shooting this film. Um, I will try and show it to you even larger. Hmm, doesn't want to get much larger than that. But that 
was, I believe, with a green filter. <laughs> now this was developed and scanned by my um, the by the actual um, developers, the DMP guys themselves, and their drum. I don't know what it was, but something left these weird artifacts. It also then passed through an airport scanner, so some of this film ended up. Uh, sadly, with streaks from the x-rays, even though I asked them not to put it through the x-rays, but anyway, so I haven't shared those pictures in this case. Um, which one is this one? ND filter, I'll talk about that in a minute. This is very high contrast, it's an orange filter, so the, the black is very black in that one. It's not necessarily the best shot in the world, but it just gives you an idea um, that you get these very dark branches against an essentially cloudless sky in that case. Um, this was, I believe, also an orange filter. Although looking at it now, it looks like I shot it with a yellow filter, if I'm honest. That's <laughs> and you can see here, this is the effect. Um, this weird little streak here is the effect of the film going through an x-ray machine. So, um, slightly irritatingly, I did give my film to the attendants at the airport and said, could you check these by hand? He checked the film by hand, but he put my camera through the scanner and I still had film in it. So that's why that looks like that, which is a bit of a shame, but never mind. Um, this one's kind of a funky shot. You can tell I can't hold the camera straight. <laughs> no, it's also the sign is not straight and it's a hill, honest. Um, so this one, I marked as being a red filter. Now I'm now that I'm looking at it, it might have been the very deep yellow because it's or the orange because it's not as high contrast as I thought it was. Um, but it's definitely higher contrast than not using a filter at all. Um, this is a mid yellow filter, and actually, I, this is possibly one of my favorite shots from the trip, just because because of the contrast and because of the detail. Um, so that gives you some idea of what it looks like to um, actually have those filters in use. Um, I would show you more examples. There are way more examples in the article on the magazine that I'm going to share with you so that you can actually see that. Um, now, so just reading the last comment, actually the color filters work very well on digital when you put the white balance to manual. Uh, so that depends on what you mean by color filters. Do you mean the green and the blue? Because that would look very strange. Your picture would come out green or blue unless you're shooting in black and white. So yes, but there are filters that you can use for color film. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, will you comment on drop-in filters? Yes, I will. Don't worry. Uh, red filters for black and white infrared film. Yes, you do have to remember to adjust your focus with infrared film. So with manual focus lenses, let me see if I can reach my nearest manual focus lens, which is somewhere on this shelf. Here we go. Uh, tip of the day. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be able to see this very clearly. Manual focus lenses Nikon's ones, and I'm sure other brands, actually have a special place where you need to focus when you're shooting with infrared film. So take a look at that. Let's see if the camera will readjust. Okay, there you go. You see that tiny red dot there? So normally you would focus, this white line would be the distance between you and your subject. So let's say your subject is uh, five meters away. Well, then actually you need to move your little five to the red dot if you're shooting on infrared film. So the um, the Nikon lenses take into account the fact that people might be shooting with infrared film and you do need to adjust your focus. If you are shooting digital and you're using an infrared filter, um, not having done an infrared conversion with your camera, but actually using one of the special effect infrared filters, I've got one. I don't find the result amazingly, overwhelmingly great but you know it's a cheaper version than cheaper way to um, shoot infrared than getting my camera converted um, but ideally what you do is you focus before you put the infrared filter on otherwise your focus just goes completely bonkers so so as yeah so on Mac, monochromatic digital body they should work as on black and white film they kind of do except essentially what you're doing is also blocking out some pixel information. So it won't give you exactly the same effect. Because your pixels consist of red, blue, and green pixels on the sensor, if you whack on a dark green filter, you're essentially preventing those green filters, sorry, those green pixels in some way, recording information. So you might end up with a slightly different effect, whereas the filter itself actually allows green light to pass through and blocks red and blue light. Anyway, it's, it's something along those lines. But I would say use the built-in 
um, filter effects because they're there for that exact reason so that you don't have to put filters on the front and then you use these things for colored film because they're uh, sorry for black and white film colored filters for black and white film just so that you can um, get those effects that I was talking about so we've covered all of the the black and white filters but then there's also filters for colored film um, now Coloured film uh, filters generally address colour correction. That's what they're kind of for. So you get filters that are, for example, this is a blue. Let's see if you can see that. Yeah, it's much the colour of my top there. Um, blue filter, which you would use, for example, if you want to um, make the picture warmer. Let me know the other way around. Cooler. <laughs> this one is the one that you want if you want it to be warmer. This is an A12 um, which is, or is this an A2? This is an A2. The A12 is slightly darker than that. Um, so these two, a blue and a warm filter, were kind of considered fairly standard filters. If you ever bought one of those Nikon lenses which had filters built in, or you had to screw them in the bottom, like in the fisheye fish eye lenses, then you would end up with a B2, which is slightly lighter than this, or an A2 in your filter kit because one was for warming up your film and one was for cooling down the other way around. I'm holding up the wrong one, sorry, it's very confusing. But essentially, um, your blue will cool down your shots um, if you're shooting indoors with daylight film or you're using flash or you wanna remove reddish kind of tinges from your film, then you would use the blue. Um, if you're shooting with tungsten film or you are shooting in shade or anywhere that the light is particularly cold, then you would shoot with a warm-up filter like an A2 or an A12, depending on the extremes. So those are the filters that you use for color. Now, what we have instead in digital cameras, you can use these on digital cameras, but they will make your white balance go slightly crazy. So you want to then shoot your white balance manually if you are going to um, do that. I mean, you can put it on auto and then the camera will try and compensate for the fact that you've got a warm filter on it, a little bit like with the L1BC, um, but you can absolutely use those for those. And obviously with colored film, you can also use your polarizers. You can use your UV filters. Um, you, If you put on a colored film, if you put on a red filter or a green filter or something like that, it's going to make your picture look red or green. So that's a bit confusing. But that, um, that help hopefully gives you an idea of what you can use in terms of putting filters onto colored film. Now I'm going to talk about neutral density filters, which was what I was building up to. Um, so neutral density filters are essentially, and I've got one ND filter here. I've also got a, a Hoyer ND filter. This is a, just a plain old 8, uh, 8X, as they call it, which I think is three stops, if I remember correctly. Um, so you can see that's completely almost completely black. And essentially what that does is it blocks out a certain amount of light so that if you want to do long exposures, and you can use these for digital and for film, um, if let's say, for example, you wanted to shoot in a very, very bright situation, your film speed is stuck at 400 or 800 film, or for example, on a digital camera, if you can't get a, a lower base ISO than, than whatever your um, camera can shoot, some shoot at 100 or 64, and you still need a long exposure because you need to get all that information in, for example, with um, shooting moving water is a good example, then you would use an ND filter. Um, the other type of ND filter that they have is a graduated ND filter where half of it is dark and the other half is light. That is another way to darken your skies. So if generally speaking, you're quite happy with the way that your pictures come out, but you want the skies to be darker, you could use a graduated ND filter. That's the fancy name for them. You can also apply ND filters when it comes to darkening skies and graduated filters. You can apply that in Lightroom, in Affinity, in all of those post-processing programs. So you don't necessarily need a filter specifically for that unless you're shooting film and you don't want to do that, which I can also understand. Um, what you can't do in, in Lightroom, for just uh, taking an example, is you can't make nice rushing waves or water look completely creamy and smooth. You can't get away with that effect without actually doing it in camera, um, which is why you would want to use an ND filter. Now I have one that I'm just going to show you. It works reasonably well, but it is um, a way of shooting with an ND filter without buying C 
six different filters. Um, this is what they call a variable ND filter, and it goes all the way from about two stops, I think is the lightest, um, down to about eight stops there. Um, graduated ND filters are quite handy. It, as I say, it does work reasonably well. It doesn't, it's not super clear on the side exactly how many stops you're getting. You kind of have to work it out and read the instructions. Um, but essentially what you would do is put that on with the number of stops that you want to lose. And then that means that you can keep your shutter speed open. You can keep your shutter open for longer. So you can expose the sensor for longer um, without ending up having so much light in the camera that it overexposes. So that's what that's used for. You can use it, as I say, for running water, um, I've used it, for example, at the beach or taking pictures of waterfalls or rivers, things like that, because there's only so much that you can do in camera. If you start to set the camera at, you know, shutter speeds of a few seconds and you've got the ISO as far down as it will get and you've got the aperture as small as you can get away with without getting diffraction problems, um, then the only way to essentially get yourself less light in the camera to do those long exposures is using an ND filter. Um, so hence... ND filters are quite a useful thing to have kicking around. Nikon only did a couple of ND strengths. They did ND4 and I believe ND8, um, and they're not still made. However, there are certain lenses for some of our some of our participants here today um, will know if you've got a reflex lens. So these were particularly small telephoto lenses. They did a 500 and a 1000 mil reflex um, I think they did another one now, but anyway, 500 and 1,000 are the two uh, well-known focal lengths. Um, they were quite small lenses considering their focal length, but they had fixed apertures. So the only way to stop them down, so for example, with the 500, it was an f8 lens. So in order to stop it down, you'd have to screw an ND filter into the back. And with the 1,000 mil lens, you'd have to, it was an f11. So again, you had um, a couple of options of filter there. So those are quite useful. Um, Simon Nikon, great name. Uh, do you get color cast with variable ND filters, had a 10 stop square ND and it gave a terrible pink cast. Okay, so yeah, here's, um, now here's an interesting topic and John is also pointing out an interesting use for ND filters. So the variable, and Mike's also saying the variable ND, yes, they can. So <laughs> I'm gonna talk more about ND filters because so many questions. Um, you can get odd color, color casts with these. Uh, where's my variable ND? So I, so I got the Hoyer one just because um, it, was, it was the brand that I had access to. And I did find that sometimes I would get a kind of, everything would look slightly duller than I expected it to look, even with a long exposure, um, which I thought was very odd. However, when I used it for black and white and converted everything to black and white in digital, it worked really well. So that, is an interesting um, use for it. And it's interesting that other people comment on the odd col color cast because it does does happen. Um, I would like to say that I did thank everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, just to let you know um, that I did thank everybody. But yes, thank you to all the people that also contributed to the coffee fund um, on our eShop as well because the... Um, the, the problem is that we can't always remember that I, it's the problem, we are calling it we, I can't always remember who's done what, but I do really, really appreciate all of the contributions. So it's great that my, my little um, sidekick there, she's <laughs> making sure that everyone's properly, properly acknowledged. If I didn't acknowledge you, I'm very sorry. Um, all right. So John is mentioning that when you're shooting long exposures, you must cover the eyepiece. Yes, you must. Um, the reason being that you can get light leaks through the viewfinder onto the sensor when you're doing long exposures. That counts whether you're using an ND filter or not, by the way. So yes, if you're gonna use um, ND filters or just do long exposures, make sure the eyepiece is covered. That was an excellent tip, John, thank you. Um, in terms of the square filters, I just wanted to talk about those quickly before I get loads more questions that, um, that confuse me. So you can buy Square system filters, the two most well-known brands are Lee and Kokin. There are some lenses that don't take a filter at all. So a 1424 is my first example, 14 mil prime and the uh, eight to 15 mil fisheye. Those, none of those ends actually, 
most of the fish eyes. They don't take a filter on the front of the lens. The smaller fish eye lenses, like the 16mm and the 10.5 fish eye, actually, 10.5 fish eye doesn't take a filter of any description, so scrap that. The 16mm 2.8 and all of its previous iterations take a filter in the bayonet of the lens, but you can't put a filter on the front. So what do you do if you want an ND filter effect? Uh, well, you have to buy this strange contraption, which is a square, and you can slide your filters into them and it will give you different effects. So there are brands, um, I'm sure there's more brands than Lee and Kokin, um, but those are the two recommended brands by Nikon in terms of using... Uh, square filters for your lenses. So that's another possibility. You can also use colored um, filters slipped in that way as well. And now, first of all, to thank Ian. Thank you very much for your contribution to the Coffee Fund. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Um, now to answer earlier, um, Tadius's earlier question. So you get some long lenses, not this one, um, but you do get some long lenses which have a filter slot in the back of the lens because as I mentioned the other day, uh, long lenses generally have a kind of semi-permanent filter on the front for protection. You can't then put um, any filters on the front of that. It's very difficult. But rear filters, um, the older lenses had two types of holder. One was the normal one that you would just screw in your... Um, neutral color filter, for example, your UV filter. Um, if you, uh, let me just think, you've got the neutral color one, you've got the polarizing one, which was kind of a specialist one. It had a little cog wheel on the outside of it, so you could turn your polarizer from outside the barrel of the lens, which was very, very clever. And I remember, forgot there was one other type for the older lenses, not for the newer lenses, they also did a gel filter holder. So if you, for example, needed a yellow filter or an orange filter on your old telephoto lens, you could get a gel filter holder, put in a colored gel, and then you could use that. So that's um, what those those were, and that's what Tadius was referring to. Um, so now, Anthony says, square filters also by Nissi. Yes, that's right. Uh, do you need to cover the viewfinder on the Z6? No, <laughs> as as so many people have then commented on that. Um, you don't need to on the um, Z, you do just because of the way, the construction of the optical viewfinder on DSLRs. You do need to cover the eyepiece on DSLRs if you're doing a long exposure. Um, sorry, that sounded a bit confusing. Ah, so Johan says the 10.5 does take a filter on the back element. That's a good point. Okay, so, um, but you don't have alternative filters, which is an interesting one. I wonder why they put, anyway, <laughs> let's not wonder why Nikon do anything, but that's good to know. Thank you for that, Johan. That's very, very helpful. Um, one, one point to mention on these fisheye lenses that have filters in the back of them. Um, if you don't have the filter in the back of the lens, the lens won't always focus. So it's one of those things where you have to generally have it um, and it is a good idea to have it. Now uh, I wanted to, before I go completely off track here, um, show you the articles that I'm going to share with you. If you bear with me one moment, I'm going to switch my screen over. Gobi do also have a good range of filters, Terry. We are in touch with Gobi, uh, well we were before all this started, because the plan is to potentially be able to stock Gobi filters. That will be the next um, the next possibility that we might be doing. I'm going to switch over my screen here and show you. Uh, this is your free gift. So it is in the drive folder. It is a copy of Nikon Owner 64. It does have my article in it on the subject of fantastic filters and where to find it. Find them, I beg your pardon. But it also has some really brilliant articles by some um, of our wonderful contributors. So that one's worth reading anyway. So that is for you to download at your leisure. Um, the other link that I am about to put at the bottom of the stream, if it's not there already, is this article um, by Nikon, which actually they kind of talks about all the things that I talked about today. Um, there are a few typos I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> ever the proofreader that I am. Um, but that does show you the different types of filter. Very confusingly, under neutral color filters, they put a picture of a pink filter here. This is incorrect. That's not supposed to be there. Um, and they have briefly mentioned the graduated filters at the bottom as well. So that link will be there for you to use. Um, so you've got the article uh, in the magazine, which is in our normal folder under the free gift 
folder. You've got the link, which is going to be at the bottom of the stream for you to have a little further read on. And then the last thing I wanted to mention before I forget is that Nikon School, this is actually the US Nikon School, um, but Nikon UK School are doing a similar thing, but Nikon School in the US are actually allowing you to stream all of their classes at the moment for free. Um, and some of them are quite short and then some of them are a bit longer and they're particularly useful if you're doing sort of indoor portraiture, for example, or if you've got some of this kit that you can make use of. So just as another resource for you, um, if you've got a bit of time, I would also suggest going and following these wonderful people on Instagram because, for example, Joey Terrell, who's a Nikon ambassador, takes amazing macro shots. Um, Joe McNally, we all know, takes phenomenal uh, portraiture shots and flash shots. Um, but there's some really, really good resources here. So hopefully you can take advantage of that. I um, will find the link. In fact, it's really easy. The link is just online.nikon.com. Well, simple as that. Um, so if you do want to use that free resource, please do. It, uh, it could be helpful for you. Now, let's just have, sorry, I'm just going to look through the comments because I was chatting and I couldn't see the comments. So while sorting through some old gear this week, came across a prism filter that must have been given in the 70s. Yeah, so maybe it's similar to the star filter in that it produces a, oh yeah, so it produces a, like lots of different faces. <laughs> Where you've got like the person in the middle and then all these faces around them. I've seen those and I actually had one at one point. I don't know why. Um, so that's quite funky. Um, it's kind of like 60s, 70s music video <laughs> effect, maybe 80s. Um, and Tadia says 300 mil have, must have the filter in place. Otherwise focus may be impaired. Yeah, they generally say so with these lenses that take rear filters, whether it's the drop in filters or the ones that actually screw in the back. Nikon's recommendation is to have the filter in place, otherwise the, the focusing system won't work properly because the filter is considered part of the element construction. So that's just worth knowing in case you've got one of those lenses or you buy one of those lenses and it's missing the filter in the back. That could be a little bit disastrous. Um, so worth checking if you've got one of those lenses. I think that pretty much covers all of the different filters that I can talk about in the, the course of almost an hour. <laughs> Hopefully you found that helpful. Um, most of these filters you can still buy from Hoya, the colored filters for sure. The Nikon ones, you can only buy secondhand these days. We have a limited supply of some of them at Gray's, but the filters like the red filter, for example, I think we've got one um, in stock. The orange and the deep yellow, also very, very hard to get hold of. Greens, we have a few of. The warm-up filters and the blue filters for color correction, we do have some in stock. And we also have some of the drop-in filters um, for the bigger lenses and the rear filters for the fisheye lenses. So you can buy the Nikon ones, most of them secondhand now, from us. Obviously, we stock the front filters, no problem. Neutral color, circular polarizer, um, that's no problem. But Hoya, B&W, Gobi, they all produce sets of colored filters and also um, produce filters for both film and digital. So if you're looking at buying a full set, then you might find it cheaper to just buy a stack. I think Gobi do like a little box which has loads of different colored filters in it, which is quite exciting if you're shooting film. Um, obviously, with these filters, these are kind of a one size jobby. So these are all 52 mil and some of your lenses may be bigger. You can get step up and step down rings for these things, but obviously if you use a small filter on a big lens, you're just gonna get a load of vignetting and it's gonna be pointless. Whereas if you've got a big filter and a smaller lens and you get a step down ring, then that will work. Um, we, don't, we do have a couple of the variable ND filters in stock, Nick, but only in certain sizes. We can order them in. Um, I think we've got 52 and 77 as the main sizes that we have in stock, but you can always check with us and we can order them in if we don't have one. That's not a problem. Uh, generally speaking, one variable ND filter is about the cost of three or four, no, two or three single uh, ND filters. So if it's a filter that does five different filters jobs, then it's worth doing. Um, if you know generally that you just want a big stopper, for example, which is it does a 10 stops, I think, uh, or you just want a mild correction. And in fact, uh, I had a picture. I think I showed it to you. Let me just 
Uh, it's Friday, okay? <laughs> so obviously, I'm losing track of things here. Here is an ND filter shot, um, which was just an ND4. It was a very, very bright, sunny day. The film was ISO 400, so I needed the ND filter just to be able to actually take a shot without it being completely overexposed. Um, so you could use ND filters for that kind of thing as well if you wanted to. Right. That's it from me. I hope that um, I haven't talked you all into the ground on the subject of filters. If you do have any question on any of these, let me know. But I've supplied all the resources um, from my research, both for the magazine and for just generally helping people in the shop. Those are the um, resources that I use. I've got the Nikon website with that article on it, which is buried in the Nikon website, so it's not very easy to find. Um, and then our free gift, which is the Nikon Owner magazine, uh, which I hope you have fun reading this weekend. And if you want to become a subscriber, let me know. Um, I write an article in there pretty much every quarter now um, on various different things, but that is for you to um, take away and do with what you will. So there we go. Thank you so much to everyone who contributed to the coffee fund today. It's been amazing. Um, it is Friday, not that that makes a huge amount of difference to anyone anymore, um, but that means I won't be back now until Monday. So all of you have a wonderful weekend. Um, keep those emails coming, keep the photos being uploaded into the drive folder. I'm really enjoying all of your uploads and I very much look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great, great time. Right, bye.